What is up, guys? Welcome to episode 73 of the Triage Method podcast. Paddy's not here this week. He's just on his way back from the States after his trip away from the summer. So he'll be back with us next week. But for now, we've got another man from the States. You are originally from the States, is that correct? Yes. <laughs> with us this week, um, Mr. Jeff Futch. Um, and Jeff is someone that you may not have actually heard of if you're not, if you're not in a niche of the Facebook internet community, <laughs> internet fitness community. You may have seen Jeff in, in some groups such as massage therapists and some physiotherapy groups having arguments about topics such as exercise mechanics or pain or injury or things like that. But otherwise, you probably haven't come across Jeff. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to, to get Jeff on this week was because very often when you listen to fitness podcasts, you end up listening to the same people, the same topics all of the time. And there's actually so many, there are so many layers to this whole fitness thing, this exercise science thing, even the very fundamentals of exercise, like how you choose an exercise. Like there are so many layers there that never get touched on fitness podcasts. So we want to reach out to some of those people who have value to offer. And Jeff is one of those people. So Jeff, tell us a bit about about your background, how you got into fitness, and how you reached the, the Triage Method podcast. <laughs> well, uh, thanks for the, uh, the very flattering introduction. I'm not sure that I deserve it, but I'll try to earn some of it here. Uh, so, background, my place, etc. As you said, my stomping grounds right now are primarily in the realm of social media. I do a lot of, I guess I could call it quote unquote work on Facebook, uh, though I do some stuff elsewhere as well. Uh, I got into the exercise world, though, uh, through college after changing my major a couple of times. I was dabbling in training and exercise and really just kind of initially started off by being obsessed with my own fitness. Simple thing. It's, a, it's not an uncommon story that you hear. Uh, that plus a fascination with all the ripped guys in the 80s action movies that I grew up watching. So I kind of combined those things. And then I started getting more directly interested in some of the physiology and some of the underlying kind of mechanistic stuff as many of the members of my family started having health problems. And so that kind of joined my sort of high end performance and fitness interest with more, I guess you would say scientific and academic and clinical interests. And again, I switched majors after studying physics for a while and pre-law, believe it or not, for a while, uh, and um, completed my undergraduate degree in exercise science in 2011, floated around for a bit, did grad school, did my uh, master's at Auburn, finished that, Auburn University in 2014, and for the last few years, I've been trying to slog through a PhD in exercise science, specifically now rehabilitation and movement science here at the University of Texas, so I've Lived my entire life academically and personally in the American South, for better or for worse. So um, there you go. I'm originally from Louisiana. I'm not sure if people can pick up on my not-so-thick Cajun accent, but I am from down there. And uh, basically, I just you know connected through social media with a number of people, that, and yourself included. Uh, and that's why I'm here. But I've just slowly started getting involved in various groups online and making connections with a few professionals whom I respect and started having more and more interesting conversations. And through a few weird strokes of luck, I've basically ended up, I guess, you know, clicking with some of the right people and starting to develop something of a consulting business online uh, where I educate and tutor people and uh, do some speaking and I'm working on a course now to expand that even further, and um, it's, it's been uh, quite a fun ride, but uh, as you said, I've been kind of on the periphery of the community for a while, and uh, despite my best efforts to hide in the corner, it looks like a few people are starting to try to drag me yep. <laughs> onto their podcast <laughs> and whatnot. Yeah, but yeah you're going to be one of those guys. But yeah, I think the, the first time I came across you, I just remember it was, very, it was a very, very specific thing because you rarely see people having these types of arguments on, on Facebook. But I don't know, someone was talking about something in relation to, to exercise and trying to like, be real specific about what they were saying. And you, were, you linked um, Mark Latash's uh, 2012 paper about the bliss of motor abundance. So that's, I love that paper. that's specifically when I came across you and I was like, God, you know, this guy is like, he's, 
he's thinking, you know, and then I realized that, you know, we had some, some mutual connections to some degree and that you had done RTS and I had done RTS. And then I was like, Oh, this guy actually also knows Charlie McMillan or Reese or whatever. And, and yeah. then it's like, ah, this, this all kind of makes sense now. And um, this guy's pretty switched on. So, so you've done, you've done, you obviously did RTS probably many years before I did. So what was it like being doing that over in the state? You obviously did that in the States yeah. with Tom, right? Um, well, it was an interesting, I had a weird kind of atypical experience with it. Um, most of the people, at least most of the people I've known in the States who've gone through RTS went to Oklahoma city, or even if they went to one of the satellite areas, um, you know, one of the other cities where they were teaching RTS, Tom did do uh, a lot of the teaching for that. As, as I recall, um, mine was actually taught by someone else, Joe DeAntonis, though I have interacted with Tom. Um, and so Joe came out to our particular facility because of just some, some differences. Uh, I found out many years later, by the way, that Charlie McMillan, um, whom I'm proud to call a good friend, is uh, he was, I think, originally going to come and teach our course. And I didn't know him at the time, so I would have met him then. I didn't meet him for the first time until two or three years later, I think. But uh, So that's just an interesting situation. Anyway, um, the guy that ran the gym where I was working at the time who set up the class was friends with Tom. He was part of the original RTS class the, back when it was still called uh, Resistance University back in 2000, sorry, uh, 1996, 97, something like that. And so, and he had his wooden placard with the Resistance University thing up there. Anyway, so he kind of said, hey, can you just have this right at my facility? Um, Joe came through, gave the class. And what was interesting was, you know, at this point, I'd finished my undergraduate degree. So this was early 2012 when I was doing it. Um, it was, I had a sense of being pretty hot stuff. I knew my stuff. I was one of the top students in my class. I I thought I understood exercise really well. And there were indeed certain things that I was pretty solid on uh, compared to other people that didn't have a formal education. It turns out my undergrad program was pretty good. It was actually more rigorous than a lot of bigger schools are. Um, but there was still stuff I didn't think about because we never worked with machines, for example. We never took what we did in say biomechanics class and actually went to the weight room and started playing with things. So there was this gap between the didactic information or the lecture content and the actual application in the field that uh, RTS began to fill in for me. I did seem to take to it pretty quickly. And I think that was probably because at that point I had not been in the industry that long. I had been floating around training and playing around in the industry for a couple of years on and off, but I wasn't, I hadn't been in for 30 years. I didn't have a huge pile of biases that I had to undo or, um, you know, I didn't have a lot of firmly held beliefs. I was kind of an open book. And so when I went through that, I was, I think I was able to absorb a lot and a few of the big lessons stuck with me. One of them being not following gurus, not following authority figures, being able to have some kind of a rational or logically defensible thought process for whatever it is you do, whether it's a training decision, whether it's a nutrition decision, whether it's some kind of philosophy you claim to have for how to influence changes in the body or even how you make an argument, be able to back that up. And I think some people who went through the course took those lessons better than others, but I tried to take it to heart. And I, I hope that that comes through in what I do whenever I'm discussing things with people, be it online or in person, or when I'm training, when I'm doing things in the gym, uh, it, it's just something that was really important to me. It really stuck with me. And I definitely think it does come through in your thought process. And that kind of brings us on to one of the points that I really wanted us to touch on was like, from my perspective now, you know, I'm obviously, I'm quite, I'm quite young myself. I'm only, I'm only 24. I've got a lot of friends who are trainers that are even younger than that. You know, they're coming fresh into the industry and very often people very early on in their careers try to emulate what authority figures do, as you kind of alluded to, you know, you look up to the handful of individuals that, you know, wear their, their halos, they could never do anything wrong, everything they say is correct. And anyone that they tarnish, I guess, is now, you know, guru status, they're gone, they're not part of the tribe. And this, this, this is often relatable in very kind of, in, in, in people in circles that we would often label as quackery, you know, but also, it's almost a thing now within 
the more science-based community where people label themselves as being quote unquote evidence-based based on often a very like small reading of any primary primary literature if even and very often just parroting information that's coming from people who who may have actually you know read the science so i think that's a, a difficult area to navigate but what are your thoughts on that is that kind of evidence based as as like a badge of honor and that kind of pseudo skepticism that i refer to it as i i love that term pseudo skepticism um my initial reaction to the evidence-based moniker is one of discomfort. Uh, mm -hmm. I cringe a little bit when people toss it around too much. It's, I've said this before to people that it, it basically has become a replacement for Acme. You know, it's just a label that people slap onto themselves or what they do because that's what you do now. now you, it's in vogue to say that you're evidence-based regardless of whether or not you really understand what good evidence even looks like or how to analyze it, how to interpret it. One of the big things I see a lot of is where people fail to understand when you do or don't need a big stack of science for something. Too many people get kind of distracted by the trappings of what they think science might be. They learn the vocabulary. They learn some of the vocabulary. They learn a few of these kind of rote behaviors. And in many cases, they reduce science to just the set of talking points. Um, not to drag it off in this direction for too long, but one example is like you see it it's almost on t-shirts now where people say you know global warming is real vaccines don't cause autism blah 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 blah. like they're these kind of rallying cries and i'm not saying i argue with those points i'm just using them as examples that mm -hmm. people are um they think that being sciencey they're sciencing correctly and i hate using that word as a, as a verb by the way um they think they're sciencing correctly if they just memorize the right opinions and then they parrot those opinions and that completely defeats the purpose of being scientific. It, it flies in the face of what proper skepticism should be. Skepticism is not doubt. Skepticism is not also just believing certain things. It's, it's allowing yourself to follow where the best evidence and best logic can take you. And that often involves asking certain types of pointed questions. And knowing how to ask those questions is itself a skill set that needs to be developed. Um, too often, I think people really just, they, they look for something that's sexy. In this case right now, claiming to be evidence-based is sexy. Having a guru figure who, you know, or a set of guru figures or authority figures, heroes that are up on a pedestal who happen to have PhDs um, might make you feel more secure in the opinions that you hold. Well, these people said it, and I take it on faith that they know what they're talking about, and I have all this addiction authority now behind the opinions that I hold so whether or not I even really understand why I believe what I believe it's dangerous um, because nobody's infallible nobody is above reproach there is not a person on this planet who cannot or should not ever be questioned I remember and I'm not gonna say who it was because who it was doesn't matter but a certain authority figure in this field whom I used to be Facebook friends with and promptly deleted me off of his Facebook after I made a cautionary point on a post because there were so many sycophants basically so many people who were just agreeing with everything this guy was saying without giving it any sort of critical examination and I said hey be careful man because people are throwing softballs at you you know and you're gonna get soft and you're gonna you know you don't have people holding you to a certain standard and if they're just yes men for you all the time um, you will suffer, the quality of your own thinking might suffer and your content, what you put out and your ability to contribute might uh, be compromised. So be careful of surrounding yourself with too many fans. He didn't take to it very kindly and accused me of trolling, at which point I responded uh, with something to the effect of, if you think I'm trolling, then you're not paying attention. But, and then he deleted me. So, but, but it came out of this effort to try to warn him like, this is dangerous. This is the thing that happens where people start putting you on a pedestal, treating you like you're some sort of a hero. And whether you want to or not, you might buy too much of your own press. You start to believe the hype about yourself. And um, again, nobody is above reproach. And so to bring it home to the original point, um, yeah, evidence-based is one of those things that people call themselves without understanding what good evidence is. And in fact, that's one of the things I've focused a lot of my own work on lately is trying in some small way to help people become better thinkers so that maybe, maybe they can 
identify better evidence, know what kind they need and when, understand what science really is more about instead of just making it a set of vocabulary words or a set of opinions, having it become more a part of their overall thought process. Um, but that takes time. That's not something that you, that's not a transition you go through in a weekend. You know, you, you go to some retreat or you go to a conference and then you come back and suddenly you're talking differently. That's not how it works. It takes a lot of work generally for years to, I think, become a decently scientific thinker or a decently critical thinker. Or I'm going to use a, a phrase that my friend Charlie uses, Charlie McMillan has used a lot, which is that of a trying to be a rational empiricist. So somebody who has a very rational and logical process for deducing things or for making inferences, whether or not there's available evidence. And then if there is available evidence empirically, using that as well and knowing how to balance them. Because sometimes when you just hold up a paper and throw it at people, you're missing the point, which again comes back to this difficulty with the phrase evidence-based and what it might mean. Yeah, and I really like that phrase, actually, the idea of being a irrational empiricist, because like, it's going to essentially like, feed into the other topics that we're going to discuss. But you cannot act as a rational empiricist if you do not actually have a foundational understanding as an exercise professional of things like your basic anatomy, physiology, yes. exercise mechanics, etc. Like you cannot be that person. So very often, like I, I, what I see in, in, in personal training and in the online fitness sphere is that that foundation isn't there. So you're left inheriting the doctrine of the individuals that you happen to follow. And it's yes. like, we, we all believe this because we are team science. You know, it's like that, like that's, that's what we believe. Oh um, yeah. Whereas I, I don't see that as being any different to the person that believes in the person that wrote a book about an, the alcohol, alkaline diet or the blood type diet or whatever. It's like, it just, oh, so, yeah. hap it just so happens that, that some individuals came across that information first and saw that as being plausible, whereas other individuals are coming across the, the quote-unquote evidence-based people and see that as being yes. plausible. But if you don't have that foundational understanding or the reasoning ability to actually explain what you're talking about, then you're essentially no better than that other person, despite the fact that you might be laughing at them. So I think we need to look inward before we, we wear those badges of, of honor, I think. Oh, absolutely. And, and you mentioned team science, and that speaks directly to a lot of the issue. I won't say that it's all of the issue, but a big part of it is this tribalism. People want to be surrounded by others who are on their team or whom they perceive as being on their team. And, you know, they want to know that their team outnumbers the other team. And a lot of this, I guess you could call it scientism or um, the phrase I like to use actually is uh, these people are science groupies. They, you know, just like to tag along and ride the coattails of something that might be scientific or that might be critically thought out. Um, but they, they're just along for the party. You know, they, a lot of these people just want to be on the right side of history or on the winning side of something. And they view it as this sort of conflict and they really aren't concerned with making, well, like you said, looking inwardly and making personal changes and becoming better. They just want to look better. They want to be on the right team and go to, and again, get invited to the right parties. And uh, I have a hard time respecting people who do that. I more respect a person who's trying to think critically and doesn't have a lot of ego. Even if they come to the wrong conclusions, at least they're trying. And that person can be helped because that person hopefully is humble enough at least to continue to evolve. So if they initially arrive at a poor conclusion, you keep showing them evidence or making compelling arguments, maybe you can steer them towards something better or they can steer themselves towards, some, towards something better. And, you know, so I think being scientific uh, is not about believing the same thing as other people who claim to be scientific. It's about having a similar process and just trying to go about it the right way. There are leading scientists, very respectable people in every field I've ever encountered who have disagreements. Both people have been in the field for decades. Both people are very well published and well respected. You can't clearly know which one has a worse thought process. They're both maybe brilliant people and very, very careful in what they do, but they still arrive at different conclusions. Why? Because science is not exact. And people keep treating it as though it is this bastion uh, or, or final arbiter of truth, and that's not what the scientific method or process should be. It, it, it's something more subtle than that. And 
So uh, again, my respect goes out to people who recognize that instead of treating it as though it's this absolutist and very tribal sort of thing. Yeah, I think it could be summarized pretty simply as like, you should respect people for how they think, not for what they think. Like that's, that's ultimately what is most important. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of merit in that. I think that there's a lot of wisdom to, to taking that approach. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there you go, the listeners, you know, because I, I actually, I empathize with this as well, because I've definitely been there myself, you know, especially yeah. if you're, if you're running any sort of social media, it's very easy to, you know, tr- fit in with a certain tribe. And it's like, you know, you see all these people that are sharing the same stuff and you're like, oh, yeah, I want to be on that club, you know, like, oh, we, we believe this. And I can see how that's attractive. And we had a previous podcast about like how, like, you know, humans love community, humans love being in tribes, and that can be very functional, it can be productive, but you just yeah. have to be mindful of, of the tribes that you're actually a part of. So, so yeah. if someone is, you know, they're trying to get beyond that, they're trying to lay the foundation, this is probably one of the more difficult things to do if you are trying to, you know, you're already a practicing trainer, and you need to take a step back and learn the, the basics again. Because this is one of the things that I think is skipped most often by trainers, where a basic understanding of anatomy, physiology, mechanics, etc., is essentially skipped. That layer is skipped, and then we just go straight to programming. You know, it's I'm I'm doing the DUP program, bro. You know, that, that's the evidence-based thing. And I think there's so much in there that we can we can tease out that's real interesting and useful, and allows you, as you said, to be that rational empiricist. So, what do you think are some of those core things that that are missing in in yeah. the personal training field? Well, there, there is certainly a lot, and, and I want to say, I want to, pre, uh, to preface this by saying that, um, yeah, to your point, it's not easy. If you've already been in the field, you're already working, you feel like you know some things, and you've, especially you've had some success with clients, it's hard from an ego perspective to step back and go, okay, there's a lot I don't know. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's an emotional need, I think, to cling to a sense of competency and say, like, no, 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 I know enough, I'm good enough. And so if you are able to step back, that's admirable. That's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Um, so kudos to, <clears throat> kudos to anybody who does that, who, who's able to, you know, to check themselves or just not even check themselves, but make sh- just realize that there's always more to know, even if it's basic. And I'm of the opinion that the fundamentals are what will most likely set you free. Um, if you're really, really good with your fundamentals, you're much less likely to be fooled because you'll know that, well, that sounds like a cool story, but that doesn't make sense based on what we know about basic physics or basic physiology. So to your point, um, one of the things, and I operate in this space a lot of exercise mechanics and biomechanics and whatnot is basic physics. You cannot get through understanding exercise without knowing Newton's laws. If you don't understand how force works, you are not going to do with that. I think it's, I think it's a silly argument, but, um, they may say that, well, I, I've known this, they wouldn't call it this, but this choreography, if you will, this, um, you know, kind of very prescriptive, if you do this many things that I call a squat or this many things that we call a bench press or a power clean or a face pull or whatever, or a hip thrust, and you, you put it into your spreadsheet with these numbers, you're going to get this magical outcome, this result. And I've seen it happen. It trends in that direction. It normally happens this way statistically. So I understand exercise. No, 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 no. You just have a predictive understanding based on the limited evidence, kind of anecdotal evidence or the little bit of empirical evidence that you have. And that's not understanding the process. That's not understanding the actual influence you're having over the body. To understand that, you have to know what your influence is. And as an exercise professional, you are wielding force. So that's the first thing. Um, if you don't know what happens to a joint when you put a weight in someone's hand or when you put, uh, you know, a cable in, you know, and a handle attached to a cable in someone's hand and say, Hey, pull on this or Hey, stand this way. You don't have an appreciation for the influence that that force and the resulting forces will have on the body. Then you're kind of stabbing in the dark. Another thing is fundamental physiology. So the basic idea that from a physiologic perspective, the body is trying to preserve homeostasis. It's trying to get back to that if it ever deviates. And what exercise does ultimately is strategically, we hope strategically, uh, disrupt that homeostasis. You're messing with the system a little bit. You're disturbing that system in a certain way, hoping that the pendulum is going to swing back the other way and adapt in that direction. So 
whether it's causing a little bit of breakdown of muscle tissue, you're disrupting sarcomeres, or you're causing an inflammatory cascade, and then the body is responding by overbuilding protein, by accumulating a little bit more contractile protein, or strengthening the connective tissue harness, or whatever, or making some metabolic change if you're you know, chronically exposing it to uh, you know, some kind of prolonged need for ATP production, so then it adapts in terms of the oxidative mechanisms, any of that stuff, it's all a response to a, dis a disruption in homeostasis. So keeping that in the back of your mind and then learning those fundamentals really, really, really well. Not how many sets and reps do you get, do you need to do according to this paper that was published in JSCR, you know, in order to, you know, to elicit a certain response. No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking going back decades to how we first understood what happens at the cellular level or at the tissue level when you do a really hard eccentric or when you um, you know, disrupt a system enough to where there's a metabolite buildup in general, not really worrying about specific reps. Um, one of the things I've noticed, and this is a conversation I've had with Charlie a lot, is that uh, for those who are listening and don't know, I'm referring to Charlie McMillan, who's uh, a great friend of mine, uh, somebody I really respect. The rational empiricist uh, comment or that phrase from earlier I got from him, so I have to give him credit on that. Uh, and he's also been a sort of mentor of mine, just a great supporter and a great friend. Uh, one of the best, now the best mind and exercise I know, period, actually. Anyway, uh, I've had discussions with Charlie um, about adaptation studies. And people love to get hung up on programming and say that, well, this person did a study on, you know, these kinds of athletes, usually, I don't know, say, let's say college age males. Uh, or males between the ages of 18 and 26 or something who are moderately trained and we had them do this many squats and we had them do it for this many reps and this many sets. And people look at that and think that that tells them something, but it doesn't because there's so much that's still unknown about what those reps looked like. What was the cadence? How deep did they go? How did they define a squat? Um, did they account for any sorts of mechanical differences, lever length differences, for example, between the different subjects? Was any of that equilibrated? Did they actually account for the amount of mechanical work that was being done at the level of the joint or at the level of the whole body moving the weight up and down? Was any of this stuff accounted for or controlled for? Because if not, then it's very hard, if not impossible, to make an apples to apples comparison between two people, which is coming into that question of programming and how people might want to step away from that a bit, not that it has no value, but knowing that um, slapping together spreadsheets and throwing numbers around may feel like training to some people, but it's not. At, at least it's not the whole thing. It's not the whole picture. If you don't know what those individual reps actually are, if you can't quantify those or can't account for those in some way, then you're missing something. You're basically assuming all of those reps on your spreadsheet are going to be the same. You're assuming that they're going to average out the way you want them to. And I think that's a hasty assumption. And you're not going to know how to analyze those reps unless you come back to the fundamentals and you understand basic physics. You understand what a force does, what a lever is, what a moment arm is, what torque is, angular accelerations, what kinetic energy is. All of these things that you can eventually put together into an overall understanding of mechanically what the body is doing or what the body has to do, then you can start to think of what kind of stresses you might be putting on the muscles and what kind of metabolic demands are being placed on the system. And then you can make predictions maybe about what sort of adaptations you might get. So it, there are a lot of steps that people like to skip basically. And I understand it because it's not sexy to sit there and do torque calculations. And I'm not saying that I do that when I'm in the gym, but having an intuitive understanding of it really helps. And, uh, you know, it's, it's sexy to be able to spit out numbers very quickly and say, oh yeah, if you do this program, you're gonna, your butt's gonna look awesome by summer. And uh, that's great and that sells, but I don't know that it's the most intellectually honest. Yeah, and I think, I think the, the absolute best thing about learning all of these basics is that you actually just avoid so much BS and noise otherwise. Like you, you essentially just have, you are, you are vaccinated against BS going forward because you just got this protective shield of reasoning where, you know, when someone, when you read a, a T Nation article or something that says the barbell row, you know, it's the best lap builder. You can kind of think to yourself, all right, you know, 
okay, that probably doesn't make the most sense based on my reasoning of mechanics and, and combining that with my anatomy. And yeah, that, that probably exactly. doesn't make a whole pile of sense. And then you don't even have to read the articles. It's like, no, I, like okay. I know, I know that's not true. A great example that just popped into my head too is this, uh, this image that went viral for a while about, uh, about text neck and how far forward your head is and how heavy your head becomes the farther forward yes. it is. And if you have even the most fundamental understanding of physics, you can look at that and go, well, whoever made this infographic doesn't know physics. They don't understand because they said, you know, like the number of pounds. Yeah. And well, the, the number of pounds that the head weighs is not going to change depending on how far forward or back it is. Now, the amount of torque that it places on the spinal axes will. And that can be a discussion that you have. But if you see how fast and loose somebody is being with a claim, then you can often just go, well, it's nonsensical. I'm not even going to waste my time with this. And if you did want to have a discussion about that subject, you could say, well, if I have a rough idea of what, you know, where those joints are, and I have a rough idea of how much a head weighs and how far forward or back it goes, then I could do some at least rough estimations of how much torque that weight is applying to those joints and thus what the muscles might have to come up with to counter it. And you don't need a study for that, which is another great thing. It comes back to that idea of being a rational empiricist, right? Having an, a good enough understanding of those fundamentals and a good enough understanding of reasoning to be able to say, well, I don't need a study to be carried out to understand how torque works. You know, I don't need, for example, if I put my arm out and I have a weight being applied here, I don't know from a study, if I move this weight up you know, a foot farther down my arm that it's going to feel heavier at my shoulder. Mm -hmm. I know that that's going to be the case. Now, intuitively, our experience shows us this, but also we just know from an understanding of basic math and physics. So I get into discussions like that with people sometimes. Uh, it reminds me of a, a conversation I had in a group. I believe the group was called Healthy Skepticism, which is so ironic. Um, and uh, I was one of the only exercise people in that group and people, somebody shared one of those articles that went really viral about how uh, a new study shows that exercise doesn't help you lose weight. And people were holding all the, a bunch of evidence-based people who didn't understand exercise were holding this up and saying, oh, this is evidence that it's all about diet. And I said, no, I mean, if you can control your diet and you add some exercise on, you're going to go into a deficit, you're going to still lose weight. And the person who was an admin for the group was like demanding that I produce a paper, you know, give me a citation for that. I said, look, if you can't be bothered to read a basic biology or physiology book first, I can't help you. It's not my job to teach you this stuff unless you want to pay me. Um, because this is stuff that's basic, basic understanding for anybody who's gone through this, this kind of field, who operates in this field has gone through some baseline education on this, the whole idea of what calories are and how that works. You're not violating that. I don't need to throw a paper at you for that. And this person was demanding it. And I said, well, then you're wasting my time and yours. So uh, again, it comes back to this idea that you, you balance the need for evidence with the need for, um, you know, just a good thought process where you can logic or work your way through things when you don't have direct evidence or when you don't necessarily need it. And uh, another thing I have to give credit to Charlie for is using this phrase evidence informed instead of evidence based. Mm -hmm. um, so evidence-based might imply to some people that you have to, you have to have like a piece of paper or a study somewhere for any piece of any decision that you make. And that's not how it works. That's not how it should work. Um, and, uh, instead just, you know, have it informing you when it can, but lots of times the decisions that you're going to make with nutrition or diet are going to be in situations that were never perfectly replicated in a study anyway. You know, you may not perfectly match the you know, the sampling group that was used in a particular study. You still have to make decisions, right? You can't be paralyzed just because there is no study exactly for you. So you inform yourself with the evidence, but then you work out the rest on your own. Yeah, and that, that text neck example is particularly funny because yeah. if you actually, if you go back to that study, it, was, it, was a, it wasn't a, a study, it was a, a computer model created by an orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Hansraj, who it was in this dubious journal. It was just a computer simulation. And it's like, hmm, I wonder could there be any conflict of interest here for a surgeon who's trying to create a diagnosis. Um, but like you read the paper and it just, it jumps between like 
pounds and kgs and pounds force and it's like what like these are not these are not the same things you know units of torque and units of mass and then suddenly the washington post comes out with this uh this article being like uh oh, a new study shows that uh reading from your phone is the same as having an eight-year-old on your neck and i'm like what how did you deduce this <laughs> yeah i don't think that's how science communication is supposed to work yeah no <laughs> pretty sure they're missing the mark there it, yeah, it's tremendous. And again, if you don't have some of those basics, you're not going to catch those. I mean, and once yeah. you're past that threshold, so many of these issues become obvious to you. You see them and they jump out at you like that is totally ridiculous. And, um, and you see that you see it in other areas too, outside of fitness or exercise or nutrition, you see it in areas of politics and areas of other other types of science, where you know, people just believe things that, uh, any person who has the baseline kind of requisite knowledge would be inoculated against to your point, right? It's uh, having a good enough grasp of a mastery of the under of these, uh, these fundamentals. If you understand these fundamentals well enough, it does protect you. It's a vaccination of sorts against BS against nonsense and worst of all against being manipulated intentionally uh, by certain people who might be, might not have many scruples and might want to take advantage of you for one reason or another. So, and there are people out there, especially in this industry, there are so many people out there who are total charlatans who are, who are trying to take advantage of you. And some of them are delusional enough not to think that that's what they're doing, but it is still what they're doing. And I, I know, I don't know of a better way to protect people against that than to just have them understand these basic ideas and ignore the title, ignore the, the credentials that person supposedly has. If they're saying something that's nonsense, it's still nonsense. Um, not that credentials don't matter at all, but you know, if they get in the way of your ability to analyze the claim, then they're not doing their job. They're actually harming instead of helping the process. Yeah. So, so one of the things that I see, I see often happen when, when people don't have that kind of grasp at the base of the basics, and it's understandable is that we end up relying on on sound bites. Essentially, we end up relying on like a collection of of sound bites that that just kind of make sense. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. all right, you gotta squat if you want big legs. It's like, okay, cool, yeah, yeah, that's that's the one. Or, or you gotta eat every three hours. It's like, okay, cool, cool, yeah, yeah. You know, or you got you gotta do just free weights if you want to build muscle. They're way better. And you just end up with these these sound bites. And it's like that that's okay for some people. Like for example, if you're a bodybuilder yourself and you follow everything everyone else has done, you're probably going to do pretty well. But if yeah. you're a personal trainer with a spectrum of clients from 20 to 60, some of whom have, you know, orthopedic complaints, some of whom have totally different goals to you and your bodybuilder friends, that's when you start to run into problems. So, yes. so what's your experience with that sort of soundbite culture? And, and if you have any examples of particular ones that are, that, that you've seen, I'd love to hear them. Uh, well, my general perspective on it is that there is, yeah, sound bites are, are very rough, right? They become about dogma. I remember reading somewhere, and I, I, I wish I could remember, it might have actually been somebody in RTS who said it. I forget, but um, there's this expression that dogma is basically the result of other people's thinking. And what you see a lot of is this tribal knowledge in the fitness world, in the exercise world, especially in bodybuilding, but in other areas as well. You see it in coaching and performance coaching. My coach did it this way and was a successful athlete and then became a coach and taught me this way and I was an athlete, so I'm going to coach you the same way. And it, 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 what happens is it develops this sort of approximation of the truth or some kind of a shadow of the truth. Like you get in the ballpark, you get in the, in the area often of what is true, but you don't know why it's true. You don't know why it works. And if you don't know why a thing works, then you're not going to be able to predict when it won't. And that is, I think, the biggest issue, perhaps, with memorizing, for example, oh, if you do this kind of weight for this many reps and sets, or if you do this exercise, you're going to get this result. Well, maybe, maybe even probably, because perhaps the majority of people who go through that indeed do it. But then how do you explain why, when it doesn't work, why is it not working? And so that comes back down to fundamentals. Uh, you made that point about if you have, you know, if you want to get big legs, you have to squat. And like all you need for hypertrophy on a physiologic level is a sufficient stimulus to the muscle. Stress it properly from a mechanical and metabolic standpoint. And you know, there are different ways you can fiddle with those stimuli, but ultimately you work the muscle hard enough. It doesn't care if it's working against a machine or against free weight 
whether it's an, you know, it, it doesn't care. The muscle is not able to from a fundamental physiologic standpoint. And so what people end up arguing about is, uh, you know, just the, the choreography there. As far as specific examples, um, there are a few, I mean, I, I, I'm fortunate. I've never messed anybody up <laughs> or had any catastrophic issues there. Um, but sadly we see it in the news a lot and I actually know somebody who did this and of course I won't name any names. I don't want to put people on blast and, uh, lessons have been learned from this. Let's just put it that way. Um, where somebody was doing plyometric quote unquote plyometric exercises, basically fairly explosive, a lot of jump based exercises with somebody and had been doing this with a lot of their clients and it had been fine despite the fact that a lot of the clients they did it with were people I would not have done it with. Um, they happened not to mess them up in their sessions. And so they had that false, I think a false sense of confidence. And one day had somebody who had an, um, apparently had not disclosed, uh, or didn't know, um, some sort of ligament injury. I can't remember what exactly it was, but just jumped to the side and bang. Uh, I think their MCL went out or something and just, you know, crumble to the ground. And the goal they had had nothing to do with needing to jump around. The person was just trying to lose some weight and get a little stronger. And those could have been very easily accomplished doing something, whether it was with machine or with a free weight in a more, con more controlled fashion. Um, I have a bunch of examples of that blending together. Um, uh, one of the big ones that actually happens a lot kind of comes to the way that trainers will project a preference on or to, or to all of their clients where um, they, the trainer does what they find interesting instead of doing what the client finds engaging. And so they just bore their clients. I've seen that a lot too. Um, so it's not that they're causing injury necessarily, but because the, the trainer is limited in their understanding of mechanics and their understanding of physiology, they don't realize all of the additional opportunities they have around them in their gym or in whatever their facility is with the tools available, available to them to give that client an experience that stimulates the tissues and the systems in the way that will get the result they want while also being more fun for that client or feeling some way to that client that is more engaging to them. So I see a lot of that. And a lot of that seems to stem out of the same problem, the same, well, if you want to get strong, you do this exercise. Or if you want to get big, you do this exercise. When it's really, you just do whatever the tissue needs or whatever the system needs. And you have so many options that really then you can tailor it based on what the tolerances and the tastes of that individual might be. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah, I, I agree. A lot of what we end up doing, you know, as trainers with our clients is essentially projecting our own experiences and, and preferences onto others. And that, and that's a problem because like, that's not, that's, that's path dependence as the result of what we've done, but also as a result of what others have done, as in you as an individual have been influenced by other practices in the past. And do you really want your client to just inherit all of those, you know, as a result of path dependence, or do you maybe want to actually have a think about what might be best for that individual? And like, me and me and Patty talk about this all the time as it relates to the the free weights versus machine discussion, which isn't even a discussion really. But you know, very often people will just return these arguments by saying, "All of the guys with big legs squatted," and it's like, like that is totally path dependence, availability, accessibility, and not necessarily true either. <laughs> but but you know, um, essentially we have these things in the fitness industry where lots of people have done them for many years for whatever reason, but regardless they're all essentially made up and when we can understand the fundamental properties that govern adaptation like you were discussing tension you know the time that, that you happen to be under tension the metabolic and mechanical stimuli etc if you can understand those on a very fundamental level you almost have this like agnosticism where you can just step back and be like yeah i can just think very clearly now because i don't immediately have barbell squat in my head or i don't immediately have bench press not to say that they're bad exercises or anything but if you can just detach yourself and think from those kind of first principles to build oh, yeah. a program, to build an approach. That's really when you start to become what I would consider like truly a personal trainer, as opposed to just the person that's kind of like taking other people's recipes and, and, and passing them on, you know, you're more like a messenger. Yeah. Are you, are you a cook? Are you a line cook or are you a chef? 
right? That's the one. Um, it's, it's a very interesting, and that's not my analogy. I've heard that elsewhere, but um, it's, yeah. I think, again, it kind of comes back to ego. I, I say this a lot when I'm talking about professionals in the industry, and I hope this doesn't come across as overly critical, but it probably will. <laughs> um, but one of the issues that, we, that I encounter a lot is that people put their own ego first. They, like you said, if you're an agnostic, if you're emotionally divorced from whatever the decision you have to make is, then you, you're more likely to make a better, objectively a better decision for that person. It's not about you. It's not about what you like. It's not about what feels good to you. It's not about you know, your favorite exercise or anything like that or your favorite food or any of that. It's about what works for the person who's paying you to take care of them. If you want to call yourself a professional, then be a professional. And being a professional means putting the client's needs front and center and focusing on, again, what that person needs, what that person wants, what that person is capable of doing, what they can tolerate, what their skills are, what their background is, whatever baggage they might bring to the table that's relevant. If they're afraid of free weights, because maybe, maybe they're perfectly physically capable of handling doing a barbell back squat, but you know, they had an injury a few years back or something where they were doing some kind of a free weight exercise and they fell over and they hurt themselves or they saw a friend do it and destroy their knee. And now they're traumatized from that. Well then probably don't force them to do barbell back squats, at least for now. Right. And if you absolutely have to do it for some crazy reason later, because I can't think of any situation in which you absolutely have to, unless you're competing in powerlifting or something, then okay, fine. Then you figure that out. But the point is you make the decisions all centered around what that client brings to the table. It is not about you. And I think maybe one of the issues that comes up also is that people, and this is natural human tendency. I do it, you do it, we all do it. Um, we gravitate towards what we're familiar with. Mm -hmm. So if all you've ever done is fling barbells around, then you're probably going to be most comfortable coaching other people and doing the same or training people and how to, how to handle that. If all you've ever done is machine work or if all you've ever done is band work, same thing. If there are certain exercises you've never been exposed to or you've never given a proper chance to, then chances are you're not going to put those at the top of your list of things that you're going to assign, that you're going to directly train or program if you're doing you know, kind of a global program for a client or anything like that. Um, so an encouragement that I would give, this is another thing I discuss with Charlie all the time, I keep falling back on him uh, because he and I just have, we talk about all this stuff so much, um, is you have to experience some things. And this sounds weird coming from Mr. Rational over here. What, who cares about experiential anecdotes and whatnot, right? You're supposed, to just be, you're supposed to just be all rational. Well, it's hard to empathize with a client if you haven't experienced, it's impossible really, if you haven't experienced what you're putting them through. And so from that angle, that's a big part of it. And also there are certain nuances that maybe you will only experience if you go through it directly as opposed to just observing from the outside. And when you are working in a very personal capacity with somebody, it's important to have some of that personal connection. So having experienced the thing that you're teaching somebody is indeed important. Um, I'm not saying that you can't do it without it, but I would generally recommend if you can, go ahead and experience as wide a variety of exercises as you can. As a trainer, expose yourself to anything that you might ever consider or feel like you should consider assigning to a client. Um, there are certain exercises you're never going to see me do um, because I'm just, I look at them and go, I'm going to hurt myself doing that. Or I, I see absolutely no utility in that compared to these other options I have that I think are better from a safety standpoint or from a, you know, a time efficiency standpoint or whatever. But barring some of those extreme examples, I think you need to branch out and, and try some things. Yeah, and I, th I think that 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 um, experience aspect is super important because I think there's some things that like you know we can look at the mechanics and we can think about them and we can be like oh yeah you know the the moment arm is increasing here and it's you know it's decreasing again here but unless you've actually experienced it it's very difficult to really understand what that actually means yes. for your client when it when it when it comes down to it and I've got a couple of clients you know who they'll do certain exercises like for example um, one of them is like a 
a cable sort of fly variation where you're using like a cuff. So you got a couple of modifications on there. And some people would look at that and they'd be like, I don't want to set that up, the effort of setting that up. Whereas for, for a couple of individuals, it's like the, the, the way that that changes their exercise experience, because there's just, they feel like it's all, all of their chest muscle is working all of the time. And it's just a really nice, smooth, smooth movement for them. They enjoy it so much that they get to look forward to that every session. And if they can look forward to that every session, that then means that they're going to put more effort into it and they're looking, yes. they're excited going into the gym. And that's where, that's where some of the things that, that like, like you're not going to get a research paper on that. You know, <laughs> you're not going to get like the, oh. the, beha the behavioral and psychological effect of programming cuff cable chest wise, you know? <laughs> yeah. And like, so, the, and then there's that. And so that comes back to this, a different kind of empiricism. So yes. there's the empiricism of having empirical evidence that's published in a journal in the form of a paper that you can cite. And then there's the more kind of day-to-day -day empiricism of, well, let me, I think it's going to work this way, but let me try it out and, and find out if under these conditions today for this person, this seems to work. So I think that's, uh, that's got some tremendous value as well. So I never want to come across as though when I say be, be rational that I'm, I'm saying don't experiment. No, you play around, you experiment all the time. And indeed you are checking, you are making observations every moment. Every exercise, every repetition you do, you have so much information that you can gather from if it's yourself, what, you, what you're experiencing or what a client is experiencing. And you're, what it is, is you're marrying that with your understanding of those fundamentals. And that's what really empowers you to make some great decisions. Um, and another thing that's important here is that we have to be realistic. Um, I can estimate, maybe, maybe where a person's joint center is and where the weight is operating, you know, what kind of moment arm it has to a certain joint, what kind of, what I might be able to estimate, it's less likely, but I might be able to get some kind of a rough estimate of where our muscles attaching that would oppose that. And I may, under some ideal circumstances, get a super, super rough idea of where something should be harder and should be easier without having experienced it myself. But because so many of those factors are prone to so much error and that error kind of compounds, if you start putting all those estimates together, you can quickly arrive at a, something that might be exactly right or might be way off. Um, that using the sensation that a person has, has a lot of value. If I'm having somebody do an exercise and I say, okay, does it feel harder here or here? Just asking that quick question. Having them report back to me their feeling brings tremendous value because in a sense, in essence, I'm giving this, I'm kind of constructing a customized, I don't know if you'd want to call it a strength curve for that person where they seem to be stronger, or weaker. So base, you know, I would take my basic understanding of how length and tension maybe relate to each other or how force and velocity relate to each other, these kinds of things from our physiology texts and whatnot. And then modify it based on, well, what, what's this person actually giving me today? Because maybe their muscle attachments are such, or maybe the muscle length is such under these conditions, or especially if it's a movement that uh, involves a lot of multi-articular muscles where muscles may not be clearly lengthening or shortening, like during a squat, right? Where three of the four hamstrings might be, quote, lengthening one end and, quote, shortening at the other end. Well, then is it an eccentric or a concentric? I don't know. Uh, and so it's hard to make those predictions, but if I go by what that person is feeling, I can get more information. So it's, it's important always to know, again, I keep coming back to this point of just balancing between having intuition or having some deep understanding of fundamentals and also being willing to just make observations and make modifications based on the evidence that you're getting in real time in many cases. Yeah. And I think I, like that's, that's super valuable because I think to hear that as well from someone who is like that kind of rational person is, is really encouraging. I think for personal trainers, because I think sometimes what can happen is when you do kind of, you know, become baptized into the evidence-based community, you know, <laughs> and you, and you start to become that type of person, you start to almost detach yourself from what's going on in front of you. And you start to make decisions based solely on, your kind of doctrine of like volume, intensity, frequency, exercise selection, rather than actually thinking about what's going on. And like a good example would be, you know, one, one of my clients, anytime they're squat, anytime they squat, their quads the day, the day, day or two after, you know, 
they'll be they'll be super sore and they know that they'll 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 have had a quad a very strong very significant quad workout all right they've trained their quads for sure especially if it's already on the program whereas with mm-hmm. me if i go into a squat i'll wake up the next day and my adductors will be killing me it's my adductors every single time maybe my glutes if i do enough if i do enough volume but it, my quads it's like very very rarely they would rarely feel like they're being stimulated as much and sure like soreness isn't necessarily a reliable indicator of the stimulus but it's giving you some idea of where that force is being yeah. is being distributed and where most of the work is done so if you're not if you're not taking that information on board then you could be the type of person who's built like a chinese weightlifter um, who gets something out of a squat and their squat looks like something and then assume that me or Paddy, our co- or the, the other half of Triash, he's 6'5". It's like assuming that he's going to get the same experience and I'm going to get the same experience as that Chinese weightlifter. And can we, can we safely assume that? Like, I'm not so sure, you know? No, I, I think the training in, in a way can be sort of, can be a microcosm of research in that you have a deep enough understanding of fundamentals and then you look at the situation and go, I think it might work out this way. You make a prediction. Um, one of the ways you can approach science, right? If you want to take this kind of classic grade school scientific method approach, you could form a hypothesis that maybe based on how that person seems to be built and based on what I know of forces and where I'm going to place this weight or this cable or these forces or whatever, how I'm going to arrange the forces in the system and how the levers and proportions in the system are already arranged by virtue of genetics and nature. Um, I have some predictions about what might happen, but then you're still going to have to test it. You're still going to have to to check that out. And then you make changes or you make inferences and you draw some conclusions based on what results you got. It's the same thing. And if anybody goes so far in that direction of claiming to be evidence-based that they stop trusting their own eyes, they're missing some of the point. And you know, it, it's, it's a strange thing that when you argue in favor of one thing, people think that means you're arguing against something else that they think is opposite. So when I say understand research, they think that means, oh, well, so you don't follow your own personal experience? No, my personal experience informs and colors every bit of research that I read and every decision I would ever make with a client or that I would, you know, any decision I would advise another trainer to make with their clients. I have my own biases based on what I have seen, but I'm simply open to other people's experiences. So if you and I are both talking about how to train a particular person and I say, well, I've experienced this. And then you say you've experienced something else. I have to appreciate that. And if I, and then if I say that experiential kind of stuff is important or the subjective experience that a person is reporting is important, some people might be silly enough to think that that means that I'm saying that research doesn't matter. It's like, no, it all matters. It all comes together. These things are not mutually exclusive. It's not some, it's not a zero sum weird kind of, you know, you have to pick one team or the other kind of situation. And the sooner more people in the field realize that and, and internalize that, I think the sooner the field's going to start moving in a much better direction uh, where you're going to have people making better decisions. They're going to stop arguing about stuff that's pointless to argue about. And instead they're going to argue about better things. And uh, they're going to be shouting at each other and insulting each other over, over slightly more important topics, which I think is progress. Maybe you're optimistic, Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, so if, if there, if there were personal trainers listening to this now, because we do have like quite a few trainers, young trainers from Ireland and the UK, like mainly, um, or even interested trainees themselves, like what would you suggest that they should do if they're like, all right, I really want to like revise my basics. Like, like, cause, cause I think there's just so many useful resources, whether it be like, you can get free physiology textbook PDFs online. You know, you can learn anatomy from various websites. You've got the can Academy, you've got all this stuff. So like, would you suggest like picking one subject and working your way through it or picking a bunch mm-hmm. of things or, or what, what would your guidance be? That's a tough one. Okay. Uh, yeah, you're the teacher. <laughs> oh man, putting me on the spot here. Okay. It's difficult because everybody's an individual and I, I do a lot of individual and small group teaching and tutoring because it's easier to tailor to what that person needs. Often when it comes to trainers, you know, they come with a variety of experiences and the reasons if you get a room full of 50 trainers and each one is lacking in say their physics understanding, they might each be lacking for a different reason. 
Mm -hmm. So I have to acknowledge that upfront. With that being said, if you're the kind of person who's not afraid of seeing a little bit of math and technical terms, like if you can look at that and not have your eyes cross, go ahead and grab yourself a free uh, physics text or something. Um, I forget, is it Yale maybe? Is that Yale or Cambridge? Or um, I, I have to look up the, the school. I forget which one it is, but they run something called OpenStax, O-P-E-N-S-T-A-X. And it's an, it's an open source, I think it's open source, at least it's free, that's the point. It's a free textbook and they have a series of these and they have one, for example, that's on physics that I've used in the course that I'm putting together, in fact. Um, they also have one that's uh, called OpenStax a and Anatomy and Physiology. So you can get a lot of the major stuff that I would emphasize if I were teaching biomechanics or teaching exercise physiology from those two books and they're both absolutely free. And you you can just download the PDFs from the website. So that's one thing you can do if you're the self teaching type who's okay with a textbook. Mm -hmm. There are some YouTube videos. I'm a little cautious about recommending a lot of them outside of the ones that I've made myself uh, <laughs> because sometimes, unfortunately, a lot of the most popular exercise sources out there are not that good. That is a lot of the authority figures out there who are super, super popular. Um, who maybe have like millions of followers aren't actually that good when it comes to explaining stuff accurately. And so they get a lot of misconceptions. They oversimplify for the sake of selling a product or for the sake of maybe they just don't understand it well enough. But in many cases they oversimplify at least because they want to appeal to a wide audience. The problem is that doesn't really help you that much if you want to understand your fundamentals. So um, you have to be careful with that. I can't think off the top of my head of any channels that are great. There are good science channels. You mentioned Khan Academy as a, as a resource as well. Of course, they've got videos on YouTube, but also you can go to the website. Um, there are some basic crash course uh, series on certain aspects of like physics and biology and all that are okay as very, very introductory sort of things. Though, as soon as you grasp that, I would say follow up on that in a textbook or in a class because they are just supposed to be crash courses. Um, beyond that, uh, I mentioned, and not that I'm trying to use this, I don't want to use this as a big platform for solicitation, but there are a few Go people out it. there who are, what's that? Go for it. That's <laughs> all you need. <laughs> yeah. Well, there are a few people out there who are putting together resources and one that I've done uh, that I'm almost finished with. I've been working in conjunction with Alex Viata of Complete Human Performance. That's a name some of you listening might know. Um, but he's a friend of mine and we've partnered up to create what's called the uh, Human Performance Analytics Core Course. So that's an, it's the foundation first main course we're putting together. That's supposed to be sort of a central, if you know all of this stuff, then you have a good foundation to be a trainer kind of course. Um, that's delivered all online and uh, I'm putting together some of the last lectures for it now. So I'm hoping in the coming weeks, we can finish things up, make announcements about launches and all that. We've been working on and off on this project for the last year and a half, two years, something like that, uh, between the planning stages and then actually making content. But in that course, I'm creating, uh, I do most of the mechanics-based material, for example. So there's an intro to biomechanics, and then I go a little deeper into physics of exercise in terms of how to work with machines and uh, how to think about reps and load and volume a little bit more, things like that. So it gives some fundamentals there. And I try very hard to emphasize thinking about these from a first principles perspective and looking at a couple of research papers and some of the takeaways you might have from those, but always trying to bring it back to here's how the system works or here's how the basic physics will work or physiology will work. Uh, and uh, trying not to make it about giving you prescriptions or giving you programming to do, but instead saying, here's how the system works. Now go and figure out your programming figure out what decisions you're going to make. I don't want you to just train a certain way and be like, oh, well, Jeff said do it this way. So uh, that's something that we're putting together in part because we haven't seen a lot of people putting anything together that's that good, that's particularly that's delivered online, that's uh, available to people. So that's what we're trying to do. And again, it comes back to understanding the fundamentals and understanding how to think about claims and how to think about science 
and having it squared away and well enough in your head that you can't, you're less likely to be fooled. Um, that's the big thing. It's not, again, about, well, Jeff and Alex said this, and so that makes it true, but constantly encouraging people as we go through the material to question what we're saying, even, and ask yourself if it really makes sense. And if it does, if it passes that test, then you can maybe internalize it and adopt it as part of your understanding. And so that's a course that I'm hoping is going to be available. Uh, but it, indeed, if you just want to get started on some things, there are some free books like the OpenStax texts that I talked about. Um, there are some free websites, um, a few that cover fundamentals of neuromuscular control and some mechanics concepts, some physiology concepts. And actually, after this is over, uh, I can dig through my bookmarks even and uh, share a few with you, Gary, if you like. Great. And, um, you know, put those together. The big thing is just constantly, constantly, constantly ask questions and do not take things on faith. Don't stop until you are satisfied that you've gotten a clear, seemingly objective, because we're all trying to be objective, but we're human, right? Seemingly objective answer to something that checks out, that passes scrutiny. Don't stop asking questions about it. Don't believe it just because a person says it with confidence. They should be able to back it up. And I, I tell that to all of my students, um, at the university level and individual students or people I tutor, any consultation clients, uh, I always say, hey, if you have a question, question me. Go ahead and grill me over it. And I'll be honest when I reach the edge of my own understanding and maybe we can go on the rest of that journey together. Um, and just be excited by it. Um, there is no end to this process. There is no, um, suddenly you pass a threshold and like, oh, I'm an expert now, I can stop. That's not how it works. You just have to be uh, to embrace the process of constantly asking those questions and always seeking a little bit more satisfying of an answer. Um, and again, whether it's fundamental physics or anything else. Um, but again, if, if you want, um, you can follow people like me sometimes on social media. And I do make uh, posts periodically that are just totally free where I talk about basic physics or basic mechanics. I sometimes write little kind of semi-long form Facebook blogs and things like that. Um, so there are a few of us out there who try to put out information, but it is hard until you have the requisite skill set to know, is this person, you know, is it, are they full of it? Do they know what they're talking about? How legitimate is this information? Unfortunately, there's no quick answer I can give on that. It really just takes time and practice and constantly asking questions, being okay with finding out that you're wrong and improving. If you're able to get to be agnostic about things and to be emotionally divorced from it, then the rest seems to fall into place. Yeah, and I, I think the the hard thing about it is that, like, stepping back to basics, it, it just really isn't sexy. As in, you don't you don't end up with a, an infographic that you can post on Instagram the next day because you learned a new you know cute fact. It's like they're just not attractive. You know, like if you're trying to learn, I don't know, something as basic as like how the heart works, you know, you're, you're learning how the heart works, you know, you're, you're trying to understand, you know, what the cardiac cycle is or how blood pressure is regulated. It's, you, you just don't end up with anything that's like, oh, here's my new hack. It's just like. Well, people, people get obsessed with, they want to be on the bleeding edge of things, right? And, and I'm evidence-based fitness and there are all these new papers are coming out all the time. And I want to talk about those new papers, but the overwhelming majority of what's going to make you a solid trainer or a solid professional in this field at all, is making sure you have all of those fundamentals from decades, sometimes centuries ago, literally um, talked about and understood, and you've gone through them and, and you've internalized the, the lessons that those earlier investigations have taught us. And what that looks like, that looks like a lot of what's in the basic textbook, it looks like a lot of the early stuff you're, from your first year of university study or you know, some of these really basic things that you think you're past, are you really? I can tell you that as simple of a concept as it is, because it's something that is covered in high school physics, you know, in secondary school physics, um, the overwhelming majority, anytime I'm in a room full of trainers, if I were to pluck one of them at random and say, hey, I'm going to draw a person lifting a weight. And can you tell me the moment arm that weight has to that person's elbow? Or can you explain to me why... A, what the angular acceleration might need to be conceptually, not even with numbers, but just conceptually what that is relative to that weight. Most of them would 
just stare at me and have their eyes glaze over because they don't know. Or maybe they knew it years and years ago for a test, but they never applied it. And so people think, oh yeah, I covered that. Well, just because you covered it doesn't mean you know it. And we need to remind, remind ourselves of that and be okay with going back to that. But yeah, to your point, it's not sexy to go back and be covering concepts that we kind of knew back in the 1800s. That's not sexy at all. That's not an attractive thing. Um, I recently did a segment for our course where I was re uh, reviewing some, uh, reviewing like where the sliding filament theory actually came from and where Henneman's size principle actually came from and had to go back to some papers before where those pap where those concepts were initially mentioned. And so in, I, I kept it within the last century, but only just, um, you know, going back to papers from the 1920s, 1930s, saying, oh, you know, th there were people doing these basic studies on how neurons worked back then, and they had some hypotheses, and these people just built on this stuff. And so it kind of comes back to that expression that there's nothing new under the sun. Um, people talk about certain exercises that are really popular now. For example, like a barbell hip thrust or something, and that's been around forever. Um, kettlebells have been around forever. Uh, you know, the, the list goes on. People have been using some kind of band or elastomer for a long time. And just because we have newer, prettier, shinier versions of those tools doesn't mean that the basic idea hasn't been around for a very, very long time. In fact, if you want something really elegant, sometimes if you go back and read a research paper or an instruction book even from the beginning of the, of the 1900s, you might be shocked at how eloquently written some of those things are. Um, it's, it's surprising, actually, that you go, wow, they kind of had their stuff down back then. Their reasoning was really, really good, in many cases better than what you see uh, these days. So, yeah, get over it. Get over this idea that uh, the new stuff is what you need to be looking at. You need to get your basics out first. And really, they're never completely out of the way. You always kind of end up revisiting them. I'm still going back to the basics of physics, rereading old textbooks or rediscovering little nuances to things. How I might talk about energy, for example, like stored elastic energy. It's a some, somewhat basic concept that I covered a long time ago in school, but I'm learning new subtleties to it. And I love that, actually. If you open your mind to that, you all, you'll always find something new, even in those, those old basics that you think you've covered, that you think you already know. And uh, that's rewarding. And I think it's, it does something for your character, too. I think there's some personal value you can get out of that, out of learning to go back to something old and look at it again and learn something else about it. Yeah, and I think that's the true difference between like truly being someone who enjoys learning and the scientific process and the type of person who's like, you're only doing it to pass it on on Instagram, you know, or to, to make a new yeah. set of stories or whatever. Because I like, I know some people like that who I know that everything they're posting is right on the edge of what they know. Like they just learned it and now they're posting it. And then their next post will be that process of the week in the interim where they've just learned that thing as well. And like, I understand where the, I understand where that's coming from. I understand the need for people to, to stay on, stay on the edge, you know, as a trainer and, and to try and look novel. But like, I just think you, as a long-term investment, the amount of return that you get from learning your basics is just so huge. Because every time your client asks yeah. you a question, you've got such clear reasoning because you've gone over it a hundred times. And it's, it's not like this one paper. It's like, no, I've, I've thought this through. This is from my fundamental understanding. And, and there's just so much yeah. less noise, I think. Oh, for sure. Um, it's just like, if you look at how a physicist handles certain laws, like laws of thermodynamics, they're not even questioning because it's, it's been so rigorously tested and rechecked and re-rechecked that and in as much as we can know anything, from evidence and observation, we know that these things are true. And you, you temper your own understanding in a similar fashion by constantly checking it, rechecking it, testing it, examining it from every angle you can. And that does some wonders for your confidence as well. Not, it's not false confidence. You have, you know, I know what's going to happen. Again, if I take that, if I take that cuff that's attached to the cable and I move it down somebody's arm, I know broadly speaking at least, what that's going to do to the forces that their body's having to come up with. I can be almost certain like, oh, I bet it's going to feel harder if I move this down and do this. And 
it seems silly to some people that might seem overly simplistic, but you do that with everything, with all of these basic, basic concepts. And then you're not having to tack on a lot of the fancy window dressing. You're not having to tack on, oh, well, there's this paper that was just published two weeks ago that everybody's buzzing about in the community. Um, nobody's taken the time to read and process yet, but we all want to be the, you know, the first person to talk about it and apply it. Um, but, you know, in the back of your mind, when you do that, there's like that uncertainty because you're not really sure whether or not it applies the way you think. You're, you're kind of sure you think so because other people have said the same thing. And maybe maybe that random guru or authority figure with a PhD who shared it, that other evidence based person who's page you follow shared it. They say that it says a certain thing. So you're kind of taking them at their word. Um, it doesn't feel quite right at least in my experience. Um, whereas if your basics are really, really good, that, that sense of uncertainty isn't as bad. It's much more manageable. Um, sometimes it goes away almost entirely. But we always can still make mistakes and we always have more to learn. Those fundamentals really help to save you. Uh, and they help to build your confidence and your competency as a trainer, as a professional in general. Um, I can't recommend it enough. So go ahead and read the new stuff, but spend at least as much time on the basics. I would suggest more honestly. Um, don't get distracted by all the fancy new stuff. Um, you're trying to learn how, how to engineer a vehicle. Maybe it helps to learn the basics of a combustion engine first before, you know, looking at that $2 million, you know, unique sports car that they only make 15 of or whatever. Uh, you might want to look at something a little bit more basic first. Uh, Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe there are some engineers out there who are listening. <laughs> if you're completely full of it, you don't know what you're talking about. But the concept is simply that you know, start, start from those fundamentals, you know, and don't ignore them. Yeah. So I suppose before we close this out, I want to ask you a very important question. Jeff, what type of uh -oh. trainer do you identify as? You kettlebell guy? You CrossFit guy? <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I'm all burpees all the time. No. Um, <laughs> Funny thing, I am a yeah. I I'm not that tall of a guy, but I have long legs, so I have the leg length of somebody who's a few, on average, a few inches taller. And uh, so I tend to joke that anytime I'm doing like any at least free weight lower body stuff, any kinds of squatting or anything like that, I'm like, all right, low back day, let's do it. <laughs> this is how I fold up, you know. And it's uh, some people get it, some people don't. But uh, when people if I'm in a group exercise setting for whatever reason or in a martial arts class or something and they're like, let's do burpees. I'm like, that's not um, <laughs> just cause for me, they hurt. Uh, so yeah, be careful about identifying as a, as a certain thing, right? Um, it's fine. It's fine. It's totally fine to love doing whatever you love doing. But when you define yourself by a single tool, I shouldn't have to explain why that's overly limiting. You know, there's the expression, uh, there are variations of it, but basically when all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail mm -hmm. and it's, uh, it's important not to do that. It kind of comes back to projecting our preferences onto, onto clients, onto people. It doesn't matter. Uh, their needs, their body, their body doesn't care what your preferences are. It needs what it needs. Um, they want what they want as a client. And so you've got to be open to that, you know, and if you know, if you think that something's outside of your skill set, then be honest about that and don't, you know, don't mislead anybody, find somebody better if there is somebody better, you know, if that, if they need a specific kind of skill. So yeah, I don't identify as anything as a trainer. I'm a very mediocre martial artist. I'll tell people that, um, but I don't make other people do that. <laughs> You've got, you've got TKD in your Instagram name though, and a picture of you in a gi or kimono or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. So I do judo a lot now and I started off doing taekwondo and so martial arts is a huge part of my life. But, um, yeah, that's a, that's a very, I don't want to say a personal thing. I don't mean in personal in terms of being private. It's just, it's something that's brought me a lot of personal happiness, uh, yeah. despite the fact that my body is a mess. Um, <laughs> so that's another thing too, right? You have to understand the, uh, the give and take there. So I enjoy it but I don't necessarily expect others to do the same things that I do. So as a trainer, as any kind of professional, love what you love. Don't assume others are going to love the same things. Yeah. So you don't, you don't just like 
you wouldn't take on a new client who wants to lose weight and be like, all right, we're going to go roll for an hour. You know, that's what we're doing. We're doing judo. Unless rolls. they no, really no. wanted to do that. You know, if they, if they really, really had it in their head that that's how they needed to do it. Okay. We can talk. Um, but otherwise there are, there are probably other much more, uh, much less risky means of doing it. Maybe. But Maybe. yeah. Um, so to close this out, Jeff, you obviously discussed the course that you're working on already, but where else can people find out more about you, about your, your work, anything you're working on, anything you want to plug, basically, this is your chance. <laughs> okay. Okay. So of course you have my name, Jeff Futch. You can actually find me directly on Facebook. I share a lot of stuff publicly. Um, I have a separate page where I periodically share some physics, uh, physics stuff, fitness stuff, et cetera, sometimes broad science stuff as well. Uh, and that page is on Facebook simply called Fitness Musings. It used to have a longer, more pretentious sounding name. Um, it used to be Musings of a Fitness Intellectual, which was tongue in cheek, but people didn't realize that it was tongue in cheek. So they thought I was seriously calling myself some highfalutin intellectual. Um, so I, I shortened it. Um, so Fitness Musings. I'm working on a website that's not really ready yet. Um, but unfortunately, I wish you were ready as of this recording. Um, but <laughs> or my business identity, basically. And um, that is FitPro Analytics. Uh, FitPro, one word, analytics is the second word. There you go. Um, it's also listed on Alex Viata's website. So for complete human performance, um, he has my logo listed for our core course that we are creating. So it's a collaboration between his professional identity and mine, basically. Uh, so you can find information about the course there on at completehumanperformance.com. Um, you can look up the courses that are offered there, and there's one that's called uh, HPA, Human Performance Analytics Core, C-O-R-E. Um, and so that's the collaboration between the two of us, and it'll have a listing of some of the topics there as well. So you've got that website for some of the formal work that we're doing in terms of uh, coursework that people can plan. Uh, but in addition, it's just my, uh, my personal page where I actually share a lot of stuff uh, publicly about exercise and whatnot. I have my fitness page where I do it as well, uh, my website that I'm trying to build. And a final thing is that uh, Alex also has a Patreon that he has recently started where he's compiled some of his Instagram musings and whatnot. And I'm about to start uh, contributing biomechanics related, primarily biomechanics related material um, to that Patreon as well. And so if people are interested, they can also check that out. But there's plenty of free stuff that you can see just by following uh, my Facebook, either my Facebook pages. Occasionally I'll post stuff uh, on my Instagram, though my Instagram is also sort of just a personal knock around goof off page. You can see some information on there as well. And, uh, and that is Travis, that's G-R-A-V-I-S-T-K-D. Um, as Gary mentioned, I have TKD for Taekwondo in my, uh, my handle. So there are a few different places where you can find me. Um, or uh, you may see me occasionally harassing people on their podcasts again. In the future. We'll see how that all works out for me. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to see what the response was to this podcast. Maybe everyone will be like, oh, that guy's a pain in the ass. Or oh, they'll, be like, they'll be like, we want more exercise mechanics, which I'm sure they will. So maybe we'll get you back on sometime for maybe exercise back. mechanics Q&A or something. I think that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, we could do that for sure. And uh, I could even go as far as maybe to, to pull out my whiteboard and draw some stuff. But um, <laughs> at, at very least, I can answer questions about that. I'd be happy to. Brilliant. that will be fantastic. So. Thank you to Jeff for coming on. And next week we will have Patty again. So that's the end of this podcast, guys. Thank you very much for listening. And we will talk to you again next week.